Okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, so uh, for those who are just joining in, uh, we uh, kick-started the day two of social innovation track with a very interesting conversation around building ecosystems uh, for social innovation. And we had um, uh, people from donor community like Santosh from School, uh, Shantanu Kosh from Social Finance and Morgan from uh, Cisco. Uh, we had uh, people from media uh, represented by Aniradha, the founder of uh, Better India. And we had Manoj uh, Kumar from Social Enfa uh, talking about uh, how do we build infrastructure uh, for innovation to happen. Um, some very interesting insights uh, came in. Uh, the YouTube video is available for those who missed it. Um, and today, now, uh, I think one of the big learnings from that session was how do we build for scale? How do we build uh, open systems which can be replicated easily? And uh, which sort of is a segue to our next session on uh, building open ecosystems with Sanjay Purohit, the chief curator uh, of societal platforms and Eight Step Foundation. Um, I don't know where to start with Sanjay. There are just so many hats that he wears. So I will start with the hat that he wears with, with us, uh, the NUD Center for Social Innovation. Uh, he's been a mentor to us from the time that we had been writing our business plan um, on a piece of paper, uh, has guided how we have thought about uh, uh, scale in our work and scale in the work of organizations that we support. Um, uh, Sanjay has, uh, has uh, held uh, leadership roles in a lot of strategic planning, strategy implementation, digital transformation um, uh, areas, and currently is a strategic advisor to a lot of large scale societal platforms which are being built in India. Um, previously uh, worked in the technology space with Infosys, uh, leading large organizations there. Uh, he has been uh, uh, a frequent speaker at a lot of global forums, uh, been uh, a mentor to a lot of uh, the organizations and a lot of speakers who actually came on and talked about uh, their work uh, from Echo India yesterday uh, to, uh, to a lot of new case studies that he's going to talk about today. Um, I will let um, um, let Sanjay uh, get come in and introduce the uh, rest of the people he's invited to talk about this uh, new topic that we have around leveraging open ecosystems. Uh, but the reason why I asked Sanjay to take up this topic uh, is that if we want to accelerate at fast pace, we need to leverage a lot upon people, uh, work that has been done already, and uh, we need to figure out uh, ways for other people to leverage the work that we are doing. And so how do we come together uh, as, an, um, as a sector to uh, build on top of each other's work and not replicate that everything uh, that has to be done? Um, so I will uh, let Sanjay uh, take the center stage and talk about um, what you want to do. Thank you, Priya, and uh, it's a privilege to be here, as always. Uh, and my colleague Sahana is here also with me um, to help us run through this session. Besides uh, the panelists, um, it's a, such a marvel what the Nudge Center for Social Innovation can pull off in such a small period of time. Um, literally a few hours, and boom, we are able to. Uh, get the session going, which is just amazing, right? So, <clears throat> um, the panelists are uh, amazing as well. They are they're just brilliant people here. We have Gaurav Godwani, who's the co-founder of Civic Data Lab. We have Kuldeep Dantewadia, uh, who is the CEO of Big Benefit. And we have Pratik Shetty, who's the founder of Video Wiki. Uh, it's been a privilege to know them for some time and to learn from them, to work with them, and looking forward to their uh, amazing contributions today uh, to all of you. My job today is more to facilitate a conversation uh, and we will get to learn a lot from the real work that they are doing. Uh, and uh, that's the whole idea for the next 90 minutes. Uh, I thought that I would probably frame the conversation so that we can 
put all of uh, the elements. Um, and the topic uh, that we are covering today is leveraging <clears throat> open ecosystems, right? So uh, the thing that I missed the most during this lockdown is whiteboarding. So I have made it a point that I will not do a session unless I can whiteboard. So we are going to work this like a whiteboard rather than work this like a slideshow. So here we are, uh, leveraging open systems. That's the topic that we are going to deal with today. And what we will do is I will quickly share some framing with you and then we will invite Kuldeep. Kuldeep has amazing experience in leveraging open participation. And then we'll invite Pratik who will give us a completely new paradigm of leveraging open knowledge. And then we'll invite Gaurav uh, who has been doing some fantastic work in leveraging open data uh, to be able to sort of, and of course we, an open ecosystems can have N dimensions, but we will be able to in the time that we have cover participation knowledge and data as the three elements of our conversation today. So that's the whole idea of the agenda for the day. Now, why did this conversation even come into being um, actually? And so that's the way I want to spend a few minutes, right? And so obviously we are all reeling under the whole uh, COVID-19 situation which is uh, uh, obviously, uh, which has already created an alternative future for all of us. And its repercussions, its ripples would be seen over many, many, many uh, cycles to come. Uh, and so it's important for us to understand and, and sort of uh, frame this reality in a short, medium and long-term context. Uh, the challenges that are being sort of thrown at us are large. Um, this is, a, this is a, a problem or a challenge that, that is important and affects all, all of us on the planet. So this does not distinguish between uh, poor, rich, uh, country A, country B. It does not distinguish between, uh, the only thing probably is the health condition that it slightly distinguishes between. So, so challenges are large uh, at scale. And now when we're talking about scale, we are talking of a scale that could potentially impact 7.7 billion people. Uh, it is dynamic uh, because we can see the speed at which it is moving. Uh, and the movement uh, is, it's, it's a problem that has the potential to grow faster than our ability to solve it, right? And what is what I mean by, uh, by being an extremely dynamic problem. Um, and the third is that it is a problem which is extremely complex. Uh, uh, and that's another important facet of it, which is there are so many variables and it's, its effects and its second and third order effects are are more and more increasingly uh, very difficult to predict, right? And so that's what the race, <clears throat> so large problems, dynamic problems, complex problems, which are characterized by the exponential uh, aspects of it. And I just pulled out this quote from Albert Bartlett who said the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. And most of the time we respond to these things with a linear mindset uh, saying, I will do 20,000 schools, then I'll grow to 30,000 schools, then I will do probably 50,000 schools. And so you keep going um, into this whole conversation with the construct of saying, can I keep going linearly? But the problem is uh, exponential. So we have to really think, how do you want to respond to, to this? So what should be our response? So the characteristics of response clearly are, unless we can scale our response, we will not be able to overcome the challenge that we're dealing with, uh, with speed and sustainably. Uh, because if you are, yes, Priya. Uh, could you be a little louder? Somebody messaged that they are not able to listen, uh, hear you properly. So she could be a little louder. Okay. Is this so, oh man? Okay, uh, I'll yeah. try. I'm kind of yeah. almost screaming. Are you able to hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can. My neighbors are having a seminar at the moment, but that's all right. Uh, I hope this is better. Yes, Super. this sounds yes, good. Okay, okay. 
So, uh, so we have to deal with a response that also is exponential in nature. I think I just wanted to make this point saying, we have to really wrap our heads around what does it take to create a response which is exponential, a challenge that makes things locked down. How do we respond with a response that makes things open up? And hence, I love the topic open ecosystems because we are talking about opening up as a response to the challenges. And I think that is a very important aspect. Um, so let's move forward uh, with this, uh, with this uh, thought in mind. What we have learned so far by looking at different ways as to how do people respond, right? Um, is classically think about scale what works. And so you try to find out, do some pilots, uh, figure things out and say, oh, this thing works, now let's go around. And, and we had this brief conversation, the question before, which was why can't we do model and then scale once it starts working. Uh, and the challenge we have because of speed and dynamic and complexity of the problem is we have to now figure out uh, what works at scale. Uh, when you have millions of people displaced, when you have education of 320 million children across the country displaced, it's important for us to figure out what works at scale because we are getting into a situation where we do not have the time to actually scale what works. Because if we take a few years to figure that out, there will be a generation of children which would have an interesting second, third order effect of what is happening. All of a sudden, everything has become on a different time scale. Classically, we say let's distribute solutions and now we'll have to figure out how to distribute the ability to solve because no one alone can do this. Classically, we think how do we control the system with data, but we will have to now think about how do you empower with data. And these are important characteristics of open ecosystems because open ecosystems deal with resilience and i totally am convinced that response is super critical because we have to deal with the problems at hand but it is not or we are in an interesting and world where we have to figure out how to respond and make ourselves resilient to deal with what is happening with speed at scale sustainably and so i wanted to share this thought that Maybe, and when you hear to, when you listen to Kuldeep, Pratik, and Gaurav, look for these important elements in their, in their conversation. Why open ecosystems? And I'm sure the previous panelists have talked to you about the power of ecosystems, because ecosystems are essentially about interactions. And what it does is it creates this construct of the society where we have a series of interactions happening over time. It's like if I meet Priya today, I am going to make things better if I know that I'm going to meet Priya again tomorrow. If you go back in the theory of cooperation as to why civilization happened and how agriculture happened, it's based on the fact that our interactions don't stop. They happen again and again and again. Like I said, I1, I2, I3. And that's the reason why people work together, right? We will meet again. And when you create an open ecosystem in which actors in government, civil society, and the private sector know that they're going to meet again and again, then the entire development construct, the entire relationship construct starts to evolve in a more virtuous way. And every time we meet, we will be having a better conversation, which means value of the second transaction will be better than the value of the first transaction, makes things better. And it's not only that I will meet you, you will meet people that I have otherwise met, which means my effect is not going to be some of people I meet, but the square of people I meet, right? So this will be viral improvements. Open ecosystems are all about repeated, continuous transactions getting better and better in a viral way. And, and that is the whole idea of saying, how do we leverage a way uh, of opening up participation, our knowledge, our data, so that the people who are trying to make things better 
meet again and again and again and every time they meet they th- do things better and better than they did before rather than rediscovering and reinventing and rehashing everything and they not only do things better between two people but they do better across a whole ecosystem of multiple interactions between actors in the government the civil society as well as the private sector so that's the whole idea of that the ecosystem is extremely powerful and to be able to leverage this ecosystem's powerful we said we are going to focus on three things we are going to focus on open participation and the reason for that is open participation creates an amplification network a network of people who are taking things that are good and taking it to more and more people or if you look at it from the way kuldeep is speak to you is people are doing good and they are doing more and more times with more and more people which is that the community is becoming solving force it is amplifying the effect of all the infrastructure all the solutions all the new capabilities that is being created so open participation is super important second is we look at open knowledge because we have to find newer and newer solutions we have to keep co create newer ways to solve how do we solve for literacy how do we solve for numeracy how do we solve for access to healthcare how do we and yesterday we have heard the eco team talk about it how do you solve for um more and more um uh, solve for water security solve for justice we need newer and newer and these are all fields by themselves there's a lot of knowledge knowledge that spans time that spans domains that spans languages uh that spans uh, different kinds of applications very important and the third important aspect is how do we ensure that we open our assets and in today's conversation we will look at data as an important element of our assets so that we create a shared infra for everyone to work right so so openness is not only about saying you know i have my content i put it on some website i have some software i put it on some git code i have some data i put it on some some server it is about understanding how does it take to leverage this openness right leveraging the openness is very important and when we talk about leveraging an openness it's important to understand that we have to be very clear that we believe in openness as a philosophy very important which means we are talking about creating public goods we believe in openness as a necessity and we believe in openness as a precondition to doing many things right philosophy is the true belief that yes openness is something the second important aspect is the technical openness right technical openness is how do you go and set up common standards how do you go and create non proprietary closed things and how do you not put things behind walls for our own benefit or our, our own limited uh, use and the third important element is legal openness how do you ensure that we are legally licensed so that people do not hesitate to use the open things that we create for everyone it is licensed for all manners of use and that it allows adaptation so openness is a, is a very interesting subject and and my i have learned a lot of this from one of my colleagues gautam who heads nilakani philanthropies but essentially the whole idea being that openness is should be seen as a as an underlying way of doing things if we are looking at driving exponential impact at scale so it's a very important element again that probably one should talk about so let's hop into our friends realizing openness let's look at some of the case studies and the first one that we will look at is and so the fundamental idea of realizing openness is how do you restore the agency so that all the actors with the resources available to us are able to realize change in different development sectors at speed and let's first talk about open participation and before i hand over to 
uh, Kuldeep. Uh, I just wanted to sort of share three important elements of this. One, it takes a lot of system leadership to really drive open uh, participation. And you will see this um, when Kuldeep, I believe Kuldeep himself is a, is a very good system leader. Who, it takes a lot to orchestrate. Uh, it's just not about saying, you know, season is open, come do what you want. You have to actually orchestrate a lot of things. Um, and hence, what do people who believe in open participation do? They catalyze, they catalyze interactions. They go and, and hit the ground. They work with people. They work with the communities. They energize them to come and interact and participate in, in an open environment. And finally, they, of course, also look at how do you do this while ensuring that you are careful with diversity. Diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds, diversity of cultures, of different kinds of uh, contexts. So I would love to hear more from Kuldeep on, through his examples, through his story, on how Kuldeep as a system leader has catalyzed interactions with the society uh, across a diverse set of uh, spaces to actually make a difference. And so let me pause, let me hand over to Kuldeep. Uh, Kuldeep, over to you. And I am happy to move the slides for you. Just tell me next. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that uh, context. And um, uh, I just wanted to kind of build on some of the things you mentioned, Sanjay. Um, one of the learnings uh, uh, we had early days, but uh, in COVID, it kind of got validated was that when uh, systems are closed and um, when systems are uh, centralized, uh, the problem solving process in the ecosystem actually tends to become more fragile because you're trying to uh, push a one size fits all approach to the larger community. And um, uh, especially in, 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 in the whole COVID situation uh, while working with certain governments, uh, we realized that that's not necessarily the best way to, uh, you know, uh, solve uh, uh, issues uh, which are quite dynamic in nature, like uh, the way you said. In fact, the learning was uh, quite the uh, quite the contrary to what we all have been told that um, uh, localization and uh, if you kind of are decentralizing uh, the ability to solve, then you are actually not reacting to the problem, but you are actually um, being proactive and you know uh, understanding how to solve the problem. And certain states um, uh, in the country demonstrated that approach rather than. Uh, just distributing knowledge or just distributing uh, solutions, the ability, distributing the ability to solve. So uh, it's a great uh, context uh, in terms of how community uh, can come together and how we can use the community's local understanding of ecosystems um, to solve problems probably at a much faster rate um, and enrich a larger uh, ecosystem. So. Uh, just to give context uh, to the audience, um, ReBenefit is a six-year-old organization. And um, one of the things uh, we have been trying to uh, solve in a small way is how do we get citizens to become more active problem solvers in their community? So how can we make them citizen problem solvers rather than consumers of information um, uh, and you know just being passive when it comes to local issues because local issues are wicked in nature. And um, they have to be uh, resolved um, with the local people itself, with their local knowledge. Um, and the audience we have predominantly worked with is young people. Uh, we realized that uh, if we can build this muscle or like what Sanjay said, if we can orchestrate this interaction uh, early in life and then create communities uh, through which um, uh, the interactions increase uh, and the self-efficacy also uh, increases, then you have a very vibrant community of people who have taken that step to start becoming citizen problem solvers, but they also expand the community around. Uh, so while we started off, uh, we, re we started realizing that uh, um, the citizens, uh, especially these young people, uh, play a very, very uh, powerful role uh, in kind of A, being the bridge between the government and the issues, but they're also very good assistive supply side partners as in you have a huge 
skilled workforce which can contribute to the government but also can be very smart demand side partners in asking for uh, certain capacities which the state has to offer so uh, if moving to the first slide uh, sanjay so the first thing uh, we started seeing was um, these young people uh, uh, we, we we did a research and we realized that for the first time people report issues uh, in their communities is uh, uh, at the age of 35 and plus so we were the question was how do we kind of bridge this gap and how do we start making uh, young people in their communities feel that they are moving sensors themselves and uh, we realized that if young people or if citizens can start uh, reporting or crowdsourcing local data then the ownership around that local data is much more uh, the way we uh, we we kind of uh, moved ahead with the uh, crowdsourcing of this local data was just not reporting but having nudges uh, which are community driven and individual driven wherein the citizens move from one level to another that rather than a reporting uh, tool but how do they actually start understanding the intricacies of what is happening so to give you an example say you you report a garbage issue in your area which is a public health issue then the next nudge would be that uh, do you know who's your local corporator um, uh, and give them information about the corporator the next step would be that if once you know who's your local corporator how do you go about actually engaging with the corporator the the next nudge would be how do you uh, um, follow up with the corporator and the final would be how do you engage uh, with the community so what this allows for or what this does is that it it gets the community uh, involved and the community is just not a, a person who's giving information or a entity which is giving information but is actually more proactively involved in that uh, next slide uh, sanjay while we were building this community we realized that uh, there was a limitation we had as an organization and uh, uh, what like what sanjay said how do we distribute the ability to solve so just getting the community together first the orchestration was on the ground uh, on the field um, and then once that happened we started creating virtual communities wherein people would get together and share their local knowledge or how they have gone about um, solving local uh, issues in their own uh, communities and what that has led to is a lot of interesting local solutions which have emerged uh, just by understanding how the communities actually are responding to it and also giving nuanced information and making the larger ecosystem richer with with certain uh, impediments which we as people would not know of so uh, next slide uh, next yeah so let me just give you an example right here is kirti she comes from a uh, she's uh, studying in a low income school she's been involved with us for 3 years and um, what what we started off was uh, she built a team and she was working on waste and sanitation issues in her school but once she developed that muscle of uh, solving issues um, she started collect uh, doing sanitation audits um, of government schools in her own area and getting in touch with the school management committees but she went one step ahead because the agency was built and uh, she started reporting issues talking to the school management understanding what are the bu budget constraints how to uh, solve for the budget constraint issues if that is not possible if they can't get a solution look for existing diy solutions in the ecosystem reach to authorities like block education uh, officer and get the problem solved now what this has led to is we here is a young person who's moved from a, a problem mindset to a solution mindset and suddenly this uh, young person has agency in terms of not only uh, uh, building the capacity of the state by demanding for certain services which the which the state is supposed to ensure but also having a solution mindset and solving issues in the ecosystem and once she becomes a part of the larger community her learnings her experience her inspiration uh, creates a, a chain reaction and you don't need an organization to orchestrate it it's the community which is you know moving pieces uh, together uh, next slide sanjay here is another ex example uh, uh, she is vibha has been with us for 4 years and uh, what vibha has been doing is that uh, when she started off she was involved in a government exchange interaction wherein she was trying to solve issues in a low income school along with the students of low income school but with time 
as she moved up the ladder of problem solving, uh, she started working on the Right to Education Act. And now she started a very interesting initiative called as Outlawed, wherein she's uh, decentralizing and making people understand about legal issues in a local manner. So in a way, she's built a digital content wherein she's distributing simple um, uh, suggestions, simple understanding of constitutional values and making young people understand around local policy. So now with somebody like her, we are a, we, she's able to mobilize more and more people. What started off as a one-to-one -one, uh, program is slowly becoming a one-to-many. And we, I think we'll be reaching a point where it'll become many-to-many -many because now we have enough nodes in the system who are kind of moving the system uh, by themselves through knowledge or through data or through solutions. Uh, and I'll end with the uh, next, next slide. Next slide, Sanjay. These are some of the local uh, solutions which have been developed by young people. Some have scaled across the country and uh, some are just uh, uh, suitable to be in a local uh, situation. Uh, next slide. And I'll, I'll just end with, uh, next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll end with a COVID uh, example of what happened, wherein uh, what we did was uh, uh, we, um, we um, repurposed the technology platform which we had built. Uh, Sanjay, next slide, please. Um, uh, we had repurposed the technology platform and used the same community to start crowdsourcing local data around uh, uh, COVID issues in their area. That became very interesting and an important information for the government. Uh, we started um, a matching demand and supply of need in their communities. And uh, what we started doing was at a hyper local level, these ninjas or these young people were identifying people um, were providing support, but this information was going to the government so that they could take a more informed decision on how to uh, solve the problems. But now these young people are enriching this community by uh, inducting all local schemes and now what we are trying to do along with another organization called as Indus Action, we are starting a program called as COVID Ninjas. So this will be a hyper local network of people in their communities, which will help uh, in uh, assisting uh, citizens with the last mile delivery of citizen services, which they're supposed to get. And all this assistance will be done by citizens and young people in their community with technology as an amplifier and the learning and the unlearning will happen from the community itself. So there's no need of an organization to do it, but now it's being orchestrated within these communities uh, itself. Uh, I'm done, uh, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kuldeep. Uh, we'll probably pause for a few questions, do some yes. interaction. Sahana, would you help us yeah. with that? Sure. Um, so we have a question from Suki on how do you compensate for the human tendency to create and trust only closed circles and the result in networks that are open to only participants of those networks? Kulip, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think um, I mean, the trust is a very, uh, very, uh, what do you say? Uh, it, there are so many layers to the word trust in itself and uh, therefore um, uh, you know, nuancing it in, it in itself is very difficult to understand. But what, what we have realized is that uh, one of the ways uh, trust can be created is if you distribute the ability to solve like what Sanjay said, because suddenly uh, the, the audience starts feeling that they can contribute rather than just reacting to what, has, what they have been told to do. Uh, and what we have seen is that the more and more we, uh, we get uh, people to start solving and contributing to the system. Even if the solution is not working, the trust in the ecosystem just starts building and you start reaching out to people uh, who are not generally from your ecosystem. So decentralization makes the system more, uh, what do you say, anti-fragile in many ways, and that allows for more trust. Thanks, Kuldeep. Uh I probably this question could be to Sanjay to say that in a post COVID world, there would be a rise to more social innovations. Do you think it would be more tech driven or people driven in nature? Zach, thanks for the question. I think uh, everything is primarily people driven. It is tech enabled. There's nothing that is tech driven to even assume that uh, tech driven is the right way to solve things because in the end, context is always with the people. So. And that's why there are different kinds of 
uh, innovators, people who do context independent innovations, people who do context aware innovations, and people who do context intensive innovations, right? So, for example, Kuldeep's example of Salt Ninja, they are doing context aware innovations. Somebody like Kuldeep's team, they are doing, sorry, the, the Salt Ninja are doing context intensive innovations on the ground, they know here. And, and, and then, then there's Kuldeep's team, right? Which is doing context aware, saying, what does it need to get civic participation? How do you build this apps? How do you build this technology? How do you actually go about uh, creating these connections, finding people, energizing them, right? And then there is somebody who is uh, building out, quote unquote, the internet, which is context independent, right? So it happens at various level, but it is always people driven uh, and technology enabled. And I think it will get even more intensely people driven and technology enabled as we go into the future because we need more and more diverse solutions. We have a rather interesting question from an anonymous attendee who talks about, uh, I don't know, how, how much of open is, when do you really push it when it comes to being open? And open ecosystems sounds rather anti-theoretical in the basic character of the COVID virus, which by design spreads in an open system. So where, how do you kind of address that? That's an that's a interesting observation. Uh, and it comes back to the starting point where I talked about exponential versus exponential. If you have to deal with an exponential problem, you need to deal with it with an exponential solution. And uh, uh, the problem caused by COVID actually uh, spreads exponentially because of the open system or the open ecosystem. Now that open ecosystem is very different from the solution ecosystem. It's not the same ecosystem, right? So I think uh, this is a uh, probably a theoretical question in that sense that, uh, uh, and what I would just like to say that if you want to really solve the COVID problem, we have to get more and more connections, what Kuldeep also mentioned, more nodes and more interactions because that's the only way we will get the effects. I think there's a very interesting question uh, which kind of ties to this. So Sana, I'm going to jump it, where, um, where uh, Srinivas asked this question saying, how can re-benefit tech be used to solve social problems in a rural setting versus solving in an urban Bangalore? Right, so that openness is not only an urban question, uh, open participation is as valid in a rural context, right? So Kuldeep, what do you think? Uh, it's a it's a it's a great question and Shriva's uh, uh, upfront. Um, my understanding and limited. Uh, I of course have a, a certain understanding of urban and peri-urban context, but not as deep as uh, rural context. But the philosophy and the principle remains the same, uh, um, uh, Shrinivas. I think uh, I think the only catch here would be to identify the right lever of technology. So, uh, for example if we have a web platform here, which is a certain tool we are using, maybe in a rural setup, uh, a WhatsApp or a IVRS kind of setup uh, will be used. So the way I see it, technology is just uh, a matter of, uh, of understanding the context and fitting the right product for the context. But the principle, right, the principle and the belief and the openness that people in rural setups understand their problems much better and they can solve it and us going with the mindset that we are a bridge allows us to respond and react much better and faster than saying that, okay, my technology is going to go there and solve the problem. So for, for us, again, like what Sanjay said, uh, we are not a tech led organization. We are a tech enabled organization. As long as we can take this principle, uh, we don't want to go as a, as an organization from Bangalore to say rural Karnataka and tell people, Hey, we understand how we can help you solve the problems. As long as we can take the principle and the framework that these are our values, these are our principles and you people understand the problem. These problems generally can be solved through local data, local solutions and local community. And we can kind of enable a tool. You tell us what tool is suitable for you. We are in a much better position to respond to that. So, um, uh, technology is just a very, uh, uh, I mean to say uh, a horizontal thin le lever, uh, but uh, the community is a very strong lever. Once you get the community in place, they will figure out and tell you what technology has to be used, right? Like um, uh, Karnataka government came to know that they had to first come up with communication material on TikTok because the community already told them that they are on TikTok and they want it there. So in a way, uh, I, I see technology as a su support actor and not the main actor itself. 
another, we could take one more question, which is related to the question as well, is about building governance around public goods, around platform ecosystems. So then you kind of know what is, where do you draw the lines and what, who kind of holds uh, accountability. So could somebody answer that question? Sanjay or Kuldeep? Sanjay, do you want Deep. to take that and I can add? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. So it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And when you're talking about open platforms, so sometimes I ask myself, like in Quora or uh, Reddit, right? Like what is the governance system and who's kind of managing the governance uh, systems there? Um, uh, I would, I mean to say it's going to be a three-tiered approach and there is going to be a lot of trial and error. Uh, but I think getting the community involved in governance with some strong guiding principles and having a very soft hierarchical structure around it so that there's an escalation process, I think allows for the community to get um, uh, involved uh, much better. I mean, I mean, Wikipedia is a case in point. So we are not looking at like a perfect scenario where whatever is there on the ecosystem or the platform is 100% correct. As long as the response to correcting that is faster involving the community, we know we will overtake uh, um, uh, the, the governance issues on the platforms at some point. But where we are coming from is how do we get the community to kind of uh, work around the guiding principles um, around the governance structures around this platform rather than us sitting in one centralized place and deciding, okay, this is right and this is wrong. So it'll take some time, but once we get that right, it'll move much faster. That's the way I'm seeing it. Okay, uh, thanks. Unless Sanjay wants to add to this, do you think we move on and take the questions during the next slot? Yeah, I think uh, these are good discussions. They will continue and they'll come back when Gaurav goes into data. So we will uh, we will keep this with us uh, and uh, let's move forward into the next segment of the conversation. Um, and so we so far talked about uh, open participation and Kuldeep gave us um, many illustrations of system leadership of bringing different actors together resolving for diversity. We even have had a conversation that the model is as applicable in urban as in rural. And then urban is not really one humongous thing. There are many, many facets of urban. And what he is trying to do is to catalyze interactions so that more and more people come forward. And when demand becomes the supply, right? I thought that was an interesting phrase that he used that when demand becomes the supply, now uh, where people actually take up the task of, of doing things and get the agency to do what they want to do uh, because in the end it, it is something that they are the closest to and um, capable of responding the fastest. Let's then spend a few minutes with our friend Pratik to talk about open uh, knowledge. And on this one, um, before we hand over to Pratik to talk about the elements of open knowledge and what he's doing, I think knowledge being available uh, digitally or otherwise uh, in some place, uh, that is probably the 101 definition of open knowledge saying, I am not, I'm sharing it, right? So you can, whatever I have done, I have codified it, I put it in some documents or created some assets, some videos, uh, or I have created some uh, reusable artifacts and I'm sharing it. I'm putting it out for everyone to see. I'm publishing it. I'm not putting any constraints around it. But I think the bigger question is how does open knowledge inspire co-creation? Can people take that open knowledge and create something better for themselves out of it? Right? So the question is how does it inspire people to take that knowledge and make things better for themselves and the people around them. I think that's an important question rather than just the fact that it's open, right? The second important aspect is how do you share the value that gets created? Because one of the important elements of openness is that when other people will use it, they will realize value and that value does not need to accrue back to you. They can keep the value. And the moment you think like that, you make, make solutions which are not only available to people, but if people find it useful, that that utility is completely to their credit. And it takes a lot of good, solid thinking to be able to create assets where you don't want the value to come back to you, but you want the society to gain from what you have created. And the third thing is, how do you improve uh, affordance? right? Or sometimes we use the word 
which is saying distributing daily to solve because having something open vis-a-vis -vis make it easy to use are two different things. Uh, and, and it's important that if you're sharing knowledge that it's not only open, but that it's easy to use. That, uh, that openness is usable, which means affordance. And I'm not saying affordability. It's not about being free or being cheap. It's about being actually easy to use rather than saying, oh yeah, I'm very open. I put whatever I knew out. And now if you really want to use it, you got to figure out how to use it. So I think these are important questions. And I think uh, Pratik and his work at uh, VideoWiki have been an interesting case in point. So I would like to uh, move over the conversation to Pratik. Uh, Pratik, are you all set? And I'm happy to roll your slides uh, as you go into the conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sanjay. And thanks for that uh, intro on open knowledge. Uh, so since the topic is open knowledge, uh, knowledge can be communicated in different ways, right? There's text, there's audio, there is video. Uh, my primary motive of this presentation is going to be focusing on video uh, and that though the principles can be used for other mediums. And the reason for focusing on video is that we live in a video first world, right? Uh, if you look at the data, 80% uh, of internet's traffic is due to video. And more importantly, in the nonprofit sector, if you want to create a change, your end users, right? You cannot give them a white paper or you cannot give them a PDF and say, hey, this is everything about COVID-19, read it, and you'll come to know how to deal with it. You have to show them visual content uh, especially in a low literacy country like India, video becomes the best medium to communicate. It can be in education, it can be in healthcare, it can be in any sector you choose. So before I move on and, uh, oh, sorry, to give you some context about uh, VideoWiki, uh, I think a couple of days back, a customer, you know, summarized what VideoWiki does and it has, like, it's been stuck in my head ever since. Uh, and the customer said, uh, Hey Pratik, so VideoWiki basically takes a translation studio and puts it on puts it on a cloud, and that's what we essentially do. Is that traditionally, if you had to translate content, you had to pay a lot of money to a translation studio, and they used to charge you a lot of money because they had this uh, huge studios where they had to have professional mics, they had to have noise cancellation setting, and all of the equipments. But uh, because of our technology, uh, we allow it. We allow remote translations, and it's powered primarily due to uh, machine learning-based background noise cancellation. So for the first time, people can sit at home and they can add uh, do the text translations. They can add voiceovers, and VideoWiki platform automatically stitches the translated video and gives you the translated video. And we can we currently support uh, translations in ten different local languages. And my insights would also be from that perspective. So before I move on to the insights or the insights of you kind know, of translating content in 10 different languages, I would like to identify the problem because I think there's a, a wise man once said, you know, if you identify the problem, you solve 50% of, uh, of your uh, challenge, which you're looking to solve. Uh, so let's get the problems uh, defined first. Uh, the problem with open knowledge or open content right now in 2020 is not that there isn't content available out there. The problem is that all this content which you see, <laughs> the problem which you see, the, sorry, uh, sorry Priya, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, uh, right, uh, where was I? English videos, yeah, so the, uh, like if you right now search anything on YouTube, you will understand that, you know, you can get the answer to your question, but uh, what really happens is that this, all this content is in English language and 85% of India's population does not, do not speak English or do not, cannot comprehend that information. So the problem is how do you localize that content into the Indian languages and how do you get, how do you bring all this quality content, which is already there on the market, it's already there on the internet. How do you bring that content into the local languages? So that's, uh, that's the problem number one. And this is a problem number two is something which I see with organizations that's trying to create content, uh, let it be video, text, anything, is that you need to understand that you're competing with fake news. And to give you a best, like to give a very good example to reiterate this point is, is the story of Venki, my watchman. Now Sanjay and Priya have heard this story a hundred times, uh, but the, the story goes something like this, is that I was having this conversation with Venki, my watchman, um, buildings watchman, 
uh, and it was during monsoon time and it was raining heavy and just post the rains, I asked Venki, uh, hey Venki, can you clean the clogged water? And Venki was like, uh, why? And I was like, you know, because someone might get dengue. Uh, and Venki was like, oh Prateek, don't worry. If anyone gets dengue, you come to me, you know, I can cure it. And I was shocked. I was like, you have to go to the doctor to, you know, if you get dengue, it's serious. And, you know, you're telling me that you can cure it. Uh, so I asked him how, and uh, he was like, you know, he, he took he took out his phone, you know, uh, opened up YouTube, said uh, dengue in Hindi, his local language, and clicked on the first video which came out. And it was a clickbait video. Uh, the video was on, the topic of the video was Baba Ji Ramdev ki panch ghare lupai to cure dengue. And he started showing to me with, you know, with the smile in his face and the smirk in his face. And then I had to explain him, you know, that, hey, you can't just trust any information. So this is the context and this is the environment in which you will be creating content. So even if you create good content, if you, even if you create really high quality content, you're competing with all the fake news around you, right? There is WhatsApp, there is Facebook. So there's a lot of misinformation which is going around and you have to, your content does not only have to be effective and you know, it, has to be, it has to be high quality, it has to also be, nudge that thing saying that, hey, this is the right information. So these are the two fundamental problems while creating uh, open content or in any, any form or any medium. Uh, so that was the problem. And uh, I would like to discuss a couple of key insights. If you're an organization that is creating content or if you're an organization that is looking to create content for your end user or for your end beneficiary in whichever sector you are, uh, the two key insights, the first one, is uh, this is the question which I get asked the most is uh, how do I create quality content, right? What is quality content? Uh, is it great animated videos? Is it like the best and can I get the best animation studio to work on a video? And does that, does is that quality content or is like an in-person video? Is that the best mode of communicating and showing it to the end user? So how do you define quality, right? And to really answer that question, I think you should ask yourself the question is, is whatever my output I create, let it be a video, let it be a text, or let it be an audio file or any, any mode of communication, is it creating behavior change? Uh, Sanjay, could you just, yeah, thanks. Uh, so is it creating behavior change? So behavior change is the right question to ask in the healthcare and allied sectors. If you're in the education sector, it will be, uh, am I, is this video or is this content really creating learning outcomes? Is the learning outcomes really achieved? And, that question really solves a lot of a lot of your answers on quality. Even choosing the medium, like because uh, like uh, this is one organization which we are currently co-creating this uh, with uh, co-creating this pedagogy on translations for impact, which I'll talk in a bit. Uh, the organization's name is Nura Health, and they make amazing video content in for healthcare. But when you focus on the question on is my uh, video, is my content creating behavioral change or what will create behavioral change? Sometimes you understand that video might not be the best medium also. Sometimes it can be an audio file, sometimes an infographic poster that can also help. So it's all about really answering this question and then you can get your answer is an animated video required, is an in-person required video required. So the focus should always be on the outcome. Is the behavioral change happening? So talking about uh, Nura Health, right now we are co-creating this pedagogy on translation for impact. And what do I mean by this is that translating is not, it sounds very simple. Hey, but there's this English line, could you just say this in Hindi or could you just say this in X language in Bengali, Tamil, Telugu? And, uh, oh no, no, could you go back, Sanjay? Sorry. Right, so yeah, so Translations is not really simple. It's not just converting from English to Hindi. Uh, it's about really understanding your end user. And this is where we want to create this pedagogy is that we understood there are two very important points when you're translating content, right? It cannot just be a direct to direct translation. Uh, so the two fundamental points, two fundamental, uh, not laws, but fundamental uh, aspects which you have to uh, be aware of when you're translating content. Uh, the first one is simple dictum, simple diction, right? Try to keep the content as simple as possible. Try to get it to uh, so the video or the content should be able, like someone on a second or third grade standard kid should be able to understand the content. So that it has to be really simple, right? The word you have to use colloquial English. You cannot use formal terms. You cannot use the words like flabbergasted. Just use simple words: shocked, surprised, heran, right? Uh, simple diction. 
but simple diction in itself does not solve the problem. And that's where I think most of the people get stuck is that they translate a content, they use simple language and they think it works. It does not necessarily work. The second uh, point is the most uh, essential or the critical point, which is how does this video relate to that person, right? There's the environmental factor is that does this video talk about something about a cowboy or going abroad, you know, or, you know, taking a plane, like these examples won't really relate to the person, to the end user. So you have to think from your beneficiary's perspective that if I'm showing this video in Tamil, in Tamil Nadu, will, will my example of a plane work or will my example of taking a train work or taking a bus work? So even translating and having this kind of nuance and making the content available for that regional language, for that end user, that is a very critical role. And that is what we see uh, Noura Health doing a very good job in. So that was the first crucial insight, which we learned from translating content. The second one is very close to the first one, right? It's about how do you solve for regional nuances? And like Sanjay said, you know, there are various dimensions to openness and there are similarly there are various dimensions on how you can solve for the regional nuances. One is the environmental factors. Second is the dialect, right? But what I would like to talk about here today is about the technical aspect of solving for regional nuances, because when you start translating a video in one language, we'll be like, oh, this is easy, I can do it. But uh, at VideoWiki, we are tran uh, we're translating content in 10 different languages. So that's where the problem arises, uh, is that when a translator translates content, uh, especially in the languages of South, they would not like a Hindi video as the base language. They would like the video to be in English. And a lot of projects get derailed because of this small uh, small aspect, right? And at video wiki, we provide this feature called English TTS, where we automatically generate the English version of the video so that people from the South languages, the Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, they can really uh, easily translate content. And uh, so, yeah, these are like the two key insights. And just moving to my final point is Sanjay, could you go to the next slide, please? is that like working in the translation space, I have understood one thing. And if there's someone, if some, something, if people would like to take it out of this session of the video wiki session in particular, is that please do not translate content in silos. Uh, even though you have the means to do it, uh, please do not do it because we're just, it's just a response, right? Translating content is the response, but how do we really build resilience in the system? How can we create something, not only that impacts the present, but also impacts the future, right? And that is where VideoWiki is a platform which we built. Maybe there might be a better platform tomorrow, which allows you to do this cloud-based translations. But if all the organizations in the nonprofit sector can come together and can centralize their translations, and we've seen, we're seeing this in the early days of VideoWiki, we have nonprofits from the education sector, from the healthcare sector, from the legal tech sector. If all of these organizations can come today, come together and translate content, we can build something remarkable. And that is we can build an open data set on parallel human translations in 10 different Indian regional languages. And that is going to be a game changer. And I think the data session will be next, uh, but I would like to explain why it is so important in the translation sector is that, could you, Sanjay, could you go to the next slide, please? Is that if the organizations, if all the nonprofits come together, right, and build this data, it'll crack open the missing piece, which was there. So if you try to uh, solve for any serve, any sector, uh, that is like energy transportation or translation. The idea is to bring down the cost, marginal cost of translation or the marginal cost of service to close to zero. And that can be done in translations if there are two pieces to the puzzle, right? One is a good uh, machine learning algorithm, a uh, good deep learning algorithm. And Google, Facebook, they've open source a lot of the technology of a lot of deep learning algorithms. And that a machine learning algorithm is only going to grow exponentially, right? So it's only going to keep uh, growing better and better. So you can never bet against machine learning. But the problem why the translations in Indian languages are not good or why the text to speech, uh, the computer generated voice is not really, is very robotic and not really good is because there isn't any good open data in Indian regional languages. Wikipedia, great resource, 6 million articles in English. The highest article in Indian regional language is Hindi, which is 100,000, and every other language is 10,000, 20,000 articles only. So there is no good data available in the public market on the regional languages. But if all the nonprofits come together and use VideoWiki or use any cloud-based translation services, not only they reduce their costs, create better content, create content rapidly, but they can all fit to this puzzle and help solve this problem in the future, 
which is of generating this open data set and we could have a better better amazing future in the future amazing future where translations can be done really quickly right and you don't need to localize it you don't need a human intervention to come in and it can be done by uh, an ai engine automatically so yeah i would like to end with that and if there's any questions uh, please Thanks, Kuldeep. Uh, there are uh, sorry. Thanks, Pratik. So there are so, some questions coming in. So Srinivas has a question of how can video wiki be used to translate regional text in WhatsApp or video text in TikTok to drive behavioral change in rural setting? Could you give like an example of an organization that you've been working with to do this, or something related? Right. So okay. So what we have done is right now video wiki is a web app platform. But we have uh, we've just got permission from WhatsApp to do the entire uh, process, what happens in the web app on a WhatsApp uh, interface. So, and we'll be piloting this with Digital Green, where they have, where they make, Digital Green is an organization that makes farmer-based videos. It's videos by the farmers for the farmers. So what we're doing, uh, what we'll be doing with Digital Green is that a farmer can now translate text on WhatsApp. And more importantly, actually the voiceovers will be done by the farmers. So uh, everyone in WhatsApp, they know and like if you see the communication in whatsapp right in english we text each other but regional regional users they use the audio feature right they do not use text while communicating in whatsapp so everyone who talks in regional languages the farmers they know how to use the audio feature so we have uh, we are using the same technology of whatsapp the audio feature to add voiceovers uh, in whatsapp itself and that automatically uh, allows you to you know have the translated video using whatsapp as a medium instead of a web web app so does that solve the question i hope it does yeah, yeah. thanks thanks Piti, for that uh, there's a question on open source or any work that you know like say for example the work that you're doing needs good understanding of technology what nudge is required for social sector to adopt this thanks uh, lp joshi for say, sharing that question hey that, that's a really good question right uh, so hopefully we can build that technology and the nudge is that it has to have value, right? Unless a platform can create uh, value in terms of cost, can create value in terms of productivity, no nonprofit sector or no even for-profit, nonprofit doesn't matter for the matter of fact, no organization will adopt that technology. Only if they see value, they will adopt the technology. So the goal is not only just create an open source technology and put it on GitHub and say, hey, my technology is open source. Is that is that technology really effective? Is it really creating value for that organization for profit or non-profit? And once the organization sees that, it's, this is the best software in the market to do whatever the service is required, they will adopt it. I just wanted to add a quick thought here that uh, we, are, we find three kinds of innovators in the social sector. Uh, one is people who are builders, who build technology, who create something out of scratch, uh, who understand the problem deeply, empathize, understand and start building stuff and have this understanding of what does it take to create open infrastructure that others can use, right? For example, if you look at someone like Pratik, he has that builder's instinct as how do you build something? Then there are people uh, who are amazing, amazing and brilliant extenders. So they take stuff that somebody else has built uh, and then they, put more context into it or they extend it. They put it to more different kinds of use, diverse kinds of use. Uh, and that's a skill set. And sometimes builders can also be extenders. So I'm just defining these as roles who start extending, right? And then there are third category of innovators who essentially are the solvers, if you will, who will actually not worry about building or extending. They will take it, they will hit the ground, and they will use the technology to actually start going around and implementing and solving problems, I think. And I think if you look at this question of what does it take to adopt, I think we need more and more builders, extenders, solvers to come together from their point of strength. Everybody should not try to become a builder. Everybody should not try to become a solver. Everybody should not try to be an extender. Uh, and that's how you create the synergy and the, and the efficiency because the moment everybody's trying to build their own app, it's just that we are burning a ton of energy and resources and pretty much uh, building again. And I've always sort of submitted this to people saying, don't build again, always build beyond. Uh, never build again, always build beyond. What does it take? It takes a lot of com uh, communication. It take, I think all the young leaders of the sector, I think they should come together because they understand this much better and sort of create this into a movement across the sector to saying, never build again, always build beyond. 
uh, and that's how we will uh, potentially uh, land in a much better place. Shall we move to Gaurav yes. Sahana? Yes, we should. Okay. All right. So we are going to move to Gaurav with this. And as we go to Gaurav, just to share some opening thoughts. Um, we just heard uh, Pratik talk about inspiring co-creation, how he's working and getting so many people to work together, whether it's Wikipedia or whether it is WhatsApp or getting people to come together. And also, you know, digital greens to co-create. How do you do these kinds of things? Uh, he's sharing the value that's getting created with the objective of saying the marginal cost of doing this at scale should be zero, right? And that's a very interesting question if you really want to drive an open ecosystem and distributing solvability, right? So we heard about that. Now, as we, as we look forward to listening to, to Gaurav, I just wanted to say that we are talking about open data now. And this is an amazingly powerful area because data improves our ability to see. And if we improve our ability to see, that improves our ability to solve because it's very hard to solve things that you can't see. And I think that's a very, very fundamental reason why data should be open in a very, very big way because if we can't see, go back in history and look at, you know, when health was a massive issue and, we, and, and average lifespans of humans was very, very poor was because people could not see the germs and they did not know how to deal with it. And the entire evolution of science uh, of health itself has been focused on how do you improve the civilization's ability to see. And if you can see it, you can solve it. Uh, and so I think that's very important. But at the same time, I would bring back the question around saying, how do you build this as a public good? Super important. Public good, which is non-rivalrous and it is non-exclusive which means everybody has access and it is, and that's a very important question when it comes to data because data is a soil and you cannot make soil rivalrous uh, and you cannot make soil uh, exclusive because the moment it becomes rivalrous and exclusive, it has, uh, it has the ability to direct the society and create capture moments that in the directions you don't want it to go. Very important question. Second is how do you use data to empower rather than control? Classically data is used for hierarchical control structures. Vis-a-vis, -vis, how do you use data to, and actually offline, not for discussion today, is the work that the entire our team has been doing on the whole data empowerment and protection architecture. So I wish my colleague Pramod was here and his team to talk about that. But the question is, how do you use data to empower and not to control? And third, of course, I would certainly submit is, how do you use data to seek rapid evolution? Uh, how do you understand very quickly how things are moving, where to focus attention, right? Today, in, for example, it took us a little while to get some sense into what's happening with the COVID situation in India. And we're still getting our arms around it because of this very question saying, if you want to rapidly evolve, then you need open data sets around which people can think. So I think I don't want to take away, um, there's amazing thunder waiting here in Gaurav's presentation. So I will hand over to Gaurav. Gaurav, yeah. uh, over to and while we wait for Gaurav to just come in, we have a poll that we want to kind of share with the team to um, related to this topic. So request you to kind of participate, please. Uh, thanks a lot, Sanjay. Meanwhile, people take uh, the vote. Uh, I want to talk about more on open data and opportunities in this short uh, case study. Yeah. I think you can um, start, Gaurav. I think the question, answer, the responses will come in. Um, just Great. start with it. We'll just give this another few seconds. That's it. Sure. So uh, I feel there is a lot of potential on accelerating more innovation, and especially in social space with uh, open data and, and open up more opportunities for people to work on. And uh, today I'm going to discuss one of the case studies we have been working with. I have been personally associated with it from the beginning itself. Uh, it's been close to uh, five years now in this journey. And I'm going to explain how we have been uh, making uh, India's budgets more open, accessible, and usable, and easy to comprehend for people. So let me just... Uh, let me just... Uh, uh, over there. Uh, Next slide, please. Yeah, so India has more than 150 kinds of budget documents. Uh, 
each has its own format uh, and each uh, like the state governments have their own format municipal corporations have their own format even um, union government has each department has its own way of representing budgeting information so it's a big nightmare for someone to understand how we are moving financially in this ecosystem uh, it becomes real problem for anyone who is on the ground to understand how much money is coming in their neighborhood for uh, for the school uh, present in the neighborhood for for different aspects of uh, work on water sanitation and other things so that's a real challenge we are talking about uh, if you go to the next slide what we did is uh, we decided like let's start opening up some of this data in a much more easy to understand easy to access format use open data formats which are already uh, quite established and and use the open data tools around it so that more people can understand this information in a much more uh, easier manner and we are now able to push more than uh, almost 11000 data sets uh, in open uh, related to public budgets in the country and uh, we are we are having almost 2 lakh active users who come every year every financial year to download this data analyze this data for different purposes uh, drive their own insights uh, drive some community efforts in their geographies and and report some of the issues they are facing with with the governance accountability in their region if you go to the next slide uh, so one of the major innovation which is happening is more technologists are now collaborating on on open data to make it more usable understandable for the general audience so just to give you an example union budget comes with more than 1000 data sets and uh, after the speech happens you are expected to go through 1000 data sets to make a sense of what is in for you so what what we have been doing is putting all this data in a much more easy to consume format in, in form of a dashboard which we update every year with all the union budget data which comes there and you can look into what are the priorities for the sector you are working in for example if you are working in um healthcare then you can see how much money uh, came to the public health how much money came to for the national health mission uh, and and several nuances of medicines and other purposes all of it is now possible with just a simple search uh if you go to the next slide we are also seeing governments are adopting more value from this data so we have an ongoing collaboration with assam government we have what we are doing is whatever data they have been publishing in open creating tools around it for them to better analyze it uh, simple things like alerts uh, they assam itself has close to 8000 drawing and disbursement officers each officer is responsible to draw some money from the treasury and spend on different issues in their particular geography so imagine a principal in a high school uh, would be responsible for other small schools in her region to uh, get get them the salaries get them the expenses required to spend on say building toilets repair works and so on so how often are they drawing this money from from the treasury and how often they are submitting the bills is there any gap in that is there uh, any delay in in fund utilization all that stuff now the government is able to track it much better uh, all this information when they are opening up this data uh, and they can set up alerts they, because tracking Uh, 8000 accounts on a regular basis is a big nightmare so they can just uh, set up alerts which can help them identify and focus on certain accounts much more often than others uh, if you go to the next slide we are also seeing media driving uh, more data driven journalism uh, using uh, open open budget data so this is one of the article on uh, the growth of isro Uh, so we have been seeing that uh, the department of space is not allocating enough money even though the uh, growth of isro has been increasing the competition is increasing the results are getting better but the growth percentage is not much uh, so there there is a much more argument on looking into the numbers and uh, making meaningful suggestions to the government to increase the money or or make better sense so this is one case study on Uh, on that which was covered by business insider can go to the next slide uh, especially in uh, covid times uh, and and more talking about how to respond to this situation 
different civil society organizations are using open data for, for their advocacy work. One of the organizations we have been working closely with is uh, a civil society organization based out of SAM, known as Studio Nilema. And what they do is they ensure well-being of prisons, uh, 31 prisons in Assam. And uh, they are trying to analyze how well-equipped Assam prisons are at this moment to uh, deal with the whole COVID situation. And one of the things they identified as, uh, by filing RTIs and collecting certain data around this topic was uh, the prisons are suffering from peptic ulcer and a lot of uh, uh, stomach and digestion related issues. And when we were looking into this uh, from a much more granular perspective, uh, we realized, uh, if you share the next slide, Sanjay. That uh, there has been a constant under budgeting when it comes to uh, the money which is allocated for diets of district jails in Assam. And that has been the pattern for last five years. Uh, whatever the budgeted amount uh, the government parked, uh, they have been spending at least 100 lakh rupees more than that. So this is one of the major problems uh, that, that the prisons don't have sufficient budget to operate for, for the diets of their prisoners. And this becomes much more complicated now, and especially with the situation of COVID, uh, because health of the prisoners are also at risk. Lastly, talking more about the resilience uh, which, can, which the data can bring, uh, especially when it is open, is building more opportunities with the data we have. So what we've been working with the uh, government of Himachal is to look into how different treasuries they are spending on a daily basis on different key schemes. For example, if I am a farmer working on um, food security related issues, procuring more grains for the uh, regions and, and storing them, I need to understand what is the allocation for national food security mission in my district. And even if possible, go and break it down to the sub-district level. So all that information is now available and I can see it on a monthly basis how these allocations are changing for my district compared to other districts. So I can find more opportunities to work in that situation. And this is not just related to farmers. Uh, you can look into all the uh, responsibilities governments are taking up at this point, uh, be it education, healthcare, water and sanitation, uh, capital works, and so on. So it, to, to plan your uh, businesses better, it's more essential to see how the government data is coming around and how what are the priorities of the government in your region so that you can better advocate with them to uh, work on the issues you want. So this, I think, in the post-COVID world would become much more relevant as a uh, future to work with the data. So that's it I have. Uh, I think to better unlock the potential, there are two, two major uh, suggestions I would like to make. One is only more open collaborations can boost the power of open data. If I learn from your experiences, if I learn from your uh, failures, successes, I would be able to better use the data in my geography. So whatever experiments we do with the data, whatever case studies we build with the data, if we can open up that as well along with the open data itself, that would be very crucial for the communities to learn from each other. Uh, and we have already seen most of the stakeholders are caring up to this idea. Also, other, other important pillar for strengthening open data in the country is contribute open data the way you like, like to harness it. So we all complain that the data is not clean, that sometimes the data comes in PDF, data comes in so many other difficult formats, but it's also essential to look how you are publishing data you are sitting on and see from a user consumer perspective, how you can make that data what you have been working to, uh, to unlock more potential because the lens you have, others might have different from that and they can derive more value. From it. And that would just strengthen your work and, and, and the problem you're trying to solve it much more easier to, to approach towards that. So uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thanks, Sanjay. Over to you. Great. Um, thanks, Gaurav. We have a few questions around data, open data. So Anoop has asked how Wikidata can be used in the open research ecosystems in India. So uh, Wikidata is a really strong, uh, important platform 
uh, which gives a lot of uh, data generated by the community. And uh, they have built a Sparkle uh, query language on top of it, which you can query this for different purposes. Um, I see a lot of transport related information being published on Wikidata at this point, uh, be it the location of bus stops uh, or, or the routes of uh, different buses and trains. All that information can be accessible. Uh, I'm not really sure about the health infrastructure data which is avail available on the wiki, but um, uh, that is something we should definitely look at. There are a few questions on how can people upload uh, any open data. Do you, do you want to kind of address that? Yeah, yeah. So there are different ways you can uh, go about publishing the data you have. Uh, certain people use uh, Wikidata, which is already uh, a very well-established platform for publishing data. Uh, everything you publish there is in uh, CC0 license. Uh, but if you want to choose a different license, you can maintain your own repository of data using GitHub. The way people publish data on, uh, uh, the way people publish code on GitHub, you can also publish data on GitHub. And now there are so many community data platforms which are evolving. Uh, we harness a lot of work from CCAN, which is an open source data platform, which you can customize for your own use case. If you're seeing that there is a community around it, uh, you, can, you can utilize that. And if you have urban data, we have Open City by Urwani Foundation, uh, which is a community curated urban open data for different cities in the country. Um, and if you're working in law and justice, we are working Justice Hub, which is going to be uh, a centralized data platform for everything related to law and justice. Great, thanks. Sanjay, over to you for closing, um, if there's anything that you have to say. Sure, uh, there are a whole bunch of very amazing questions. There's one on how do you use open ecosystems to solve for migrant the challenges that we have. And I can assure, we had a, had a very, very uh, stimulating conversation with Anshu at Goonj, who is driving a lot of work in the context of helping with the whole migrant crisis at hand. And, and if, you, if you look at how he approaches, how Goonj approaches, it's a very, a very open ecosystem oriented approach. Again, the knowledge that he has and how you deal with this is, uh, is open, the relationships, the networks that he is building, the kind of characteristics we saw, and obviously now uh, the times are such that we have to all come together and do more. Uh, and the question would be, how do other people take on uh, the entire open knowledge of Goons and, and build initiatives which are similar to Goons to address the problem, right? So um, rather than expecting only one organization to solve the entire problem for the entire country, which is very hard. So I think the migrant, migrant challenge if you're able to drive open participation, open knowledge and open data and start to focus on things, we will again be able to deal with this problem in a much more better way rather than all of us sort of doing, trying to do this again and again. There's an interesting question uh, on how does, how do people reach out to all three of you? Um, and so, uh, well, uh, Video Wiki, uh, Civic Data Lab, as well as uh, Rip Benefit. Uh, I don't know if Priya should take this answer or Sahana should say this answer. How do we share it with all the participants that you can reach out to them? Obviously, they're all accessible, but that's one question from Srinivas. Right. Um, yeah, you could write to either Priya or, or me. Uh, our ID is info at societalplatform.org and we can connect you with whoever you uh, wish to kind of speak to. Yeah, and um, uh, you can also write to Naman, who's uh, managing this um, session at naman at encore.foundation, and we'll get back to you on how we can connect you with other people. Great. So I think we have a few minutes left, three or four minutes left. I thought we'll just kind of bring this to closure. We talked about open data, the latest, with Gaurav talking about how is he looking at data, empowering the ecosystem, and not only empowering empowering the government itself to use its own data uh, to be able to make decisions that it wants to make, right? Uh, and, and that's the reality because in the end, uh, Samaj Bazar Sarkar, as Rohini Nilakani reminds us very often, are three important elements of driving the change and whatever open ecosystems we build should benefit all three uh, to in the end solve the problems and challenges of our citizens, right? So. And we talked about rapid evolution and how things can change very quickly. So I think we have been sort of today trying to tease out the points 
around what does it take to create an effective open ecosystem? Uh, and more importantly, how do we leverage the open system? Uh, and so if you want to leverage an open ecosystem, uh, open participation tells us we have to exercise system leadership, we have to resolve it in diverse situations, we have to catalyze interactions between the participants. Open knowledge session told us, how do we inspire co-creation, make people, you know, create new things? How do we share the value that is created? How do we distribute the solvability or the affordance? And the last discussion, open data sort of summarized it in saying, let's build public goods, let's empower the ecosystem with data and let's seek rapid evolution. And I hope that you were able to uh, take away. And I think Gaurav said something very important, which I just want to sort of re uh, stress upon as soon as the screen decides to move forward. Um, which was essentially that building open ecosystems uh, summarily begins with us. And I think that's a very important element of this entire conversation that an open ecosystem begins with us. So I would like to uh, invite my three panelists to just say one phrase as to what would you want all of us to do? How do we begin being the champions of open ecosystems? And I'm going to put it to Kuldeep first. Kuldeep, what do we do? Uh, I think uh, Gaurav uh, mentioned that I think open ecosystems equal uh, leads to, uh, needs open individuals. So if uh, all of us can actually start with the first step, but from a more uh, re-benefit perspective, I'm very happy to collaborate uh, with people uh, who are trying to solve local uh, issues in their local communities, either through technology and techniques. So very happy uh, to collaborate uh, on how to solve local um, issues and how to kind of distribute the ability to solve. Thanks, uh, Kuldeep. Uh, Pratik, what do we do? Uh, I think the mantra is collaborate, not compete. That's very important in the nonprofit sector, especially. And if anyone who's listening has any need of localizing content, please do reach out. I think the email IDs were sh shared by Sahana and Priya. So yeah, that's it from my end. Super. And Gaurav, bring us home. Cool. Yeah, so co-create with community in open. Whatever we do, let's do in open. Awesome, uh, thank you so much. Uh, don't think about openness for openness sake. Think about openness as an opportunity to drive more and more uh, difference. Thank you again for all your patience uh, and all your uh, amazing questions. We have a lot of questions that we would have loved to take. So we are going to take this offline and we know who has asked them and we are going to sort of put out the answers uh, and help you uh, with some of those. Uh, but thank you so much. Thanks to my panelists. Thanks to the Nudge Center for Social Innovation uh, and all of you for this great time. I hope you learned a lot. For sure, I did. Take care, stay safe, stay, stay healthy and let us fight this exponential problem with an exponential response. Bye-bye. Sana, do you want to say yeah. something? No, thanks. Thanks to everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Um, uh, Gaurav, um, Pratik, um, uh, Kuldeep, if you want to hang around for a little bit and answer people's questions, we have time till 2 o'clock. Um, for the participants, the social innovation track will be back at 3.30 with a discussion on attracting talent to the social sector and what opportunities are, are there for anyone who's exploring a, exploring the sector full-time, part-time, etc. cetera. Um, if you're trying to look at ways to expose yourself to problems, uh, this would be a great session to attend. Um, in the meanwhile, if uh, we will try and answer some of these questions which came, um, so if you can, um, Gaurav, Pratik, um, and Kuldeep, if you can just re respond back to people, that would be great. Uh, so we also have a few people raising hands. Uh, okay. I will also, uh, I think in, uh, to make it a little more collaborative, I'll just allow, uh, Suresh Rao, I think I'll just, uh, one second. I think Anoop is talking. Hey, Anoop. I think he's on mute. He wanted to ask a question if I'm not wrong. Okay, probably not. Uh, all right. 
Anybody else who wants to pick up any of the questions? We have uh, 10 minutes and if you're free, we would love to extend this to just answer questions right now. Maybe we can look at the Q&A box if we have something left. Yeah. Uh, Gaurav, there are a couple of questions around open data. Do you want to pick up some of that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to answer some of them over text, yeah. but I can, I can do it over audio as well. Yeah. I think one is uh, how do people contribute to open data? And second is how do you verify the credibility of open data? I think there was one more question about government, which probably you have answered is that the government's openness to, to give out data. Um, yeah. How do you work around that? Yeah, so I would start from that, like uh, I think make them see the opportunities of opening up and in, invest time in ensuring what's in for them because it's a lot of investment to open up for themselves as well. So uh, what we do is do brainstorming sessions where we make them understand hey, these are certain use cases when we saw some government agencies open up, this is how they were able to derive more value out of it. So we do a lot of sessions like that with the government agencies and um, I would say 99% they get convinced uh, in, in these sort of exercise. Uh, it comes to credibility of the data. Uh, we try to document the process of creating that data. Uh, if it's created by a survey or RTA applications, just mention the mention the same that this is how you file the RTA or this is how the survey you conducted. And this is how uh, the outcome of that whole process is. Uh, so as much as you document your process, as much as you talk about the associated metadata related to the data you're publishing, more credible it becomes. And um, if you keep it in open and let people comment and talk about it, if there is any problem with that data, then more people can discuss and weigh in their thoughts as well. So uh, that's how we see uh, like more open data ensures that we have uh, more, uh, more uh, you know, authentic data as well. And uh, I think the last question which was there was around how people can contribute. So uh, there are a couple of good communities uh, which are working on data. So there is data, data Meet, which is like a Google group of everyone who is interested around open data. Uh, people keep contributing data related to various issues, including the recent pandemic. There's a lot of data being collated there uh, using community efforts. There is data kind, uh, where a lot of, uh, volunteers come over the weekend now virtually to contribute on some of these issues. Uh, and then there are organizations like us who are, um, hosting different data platforms and data related activities where people can participate, collaborate in different capacities. Thank you. Uh, Garo. I think we've answered almost all the questions. So, um, so I would just want to say thank you, Sanjay, again, for yet again, another very, very interesting conversation. And thank you for, uh, to Kuldeep, Pratik, and Gaurav for coming in and sharing your work with us. Um, I really look forward to uh, having more such conversations in future and, uh, and seeing how we can add more value to the community uh, as they're thinking about building open ecosystems or leveraging open ecosystems. Thank you so much, Priya. It's been a pleasure and uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation. Like they say, Charcha must go on. Charcha chalo yeah. rehni chahiye. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Thank right. you, Sanjay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Thank for your time. You. Thank you. Yeah.